Hallo und herzlich willkommen. Schön, dass Sie alle da sind. Auch hallo an unsere StreamerInnen im Internet. Ähm, ja, herzlich willkommen zum, in Bellevue di Monaco zur Reihe Europa und seine Grenzen voller Gewalt. Äh, organisiert ist diese Reihe vom Bayerischen Flüchtlingsrat, vom Bellevue di Monaco, Medico International und der Seebrücke München. Und es ist die letzte Veranstaltung dieses Jahr. Es wird aber nächstes Jahr noch weitere geben. Drei sind derzeit in Planung. Heute ist der Titel Bordering Europe Through Violence, Changing Modalities and Spatialities. Äh, genau, ich bin Alexandra Martini, die Moderatorin von heute Abend. Ich arbeite für äh, Bayern 2 und Zündfunk als Journalistin. Und äh, ich freue mich sehr, dass Charles Heller heute hier ist. Hallo Charles. Hallo. Ähm, ja, I'll, I'll go on introducing you. Charles uh, versteht ganz gut Deutsch, deswegen darf ich das auf Deutsch machen. So if anyone here does not understand German, um, there is a possibility of translation. In the back you can get your headphones. Und uh, für den englischen Vortrag gleich gibt es auch deutsche Übersetzungen, die man sich ebenfalls dort besorgen kann. Äh, ja, Charles Heller ist äh, Aktivist und Researcher. Er ist Direktor der Border Forensics. Und das ist eine Forschungs- und Ermittlungsagentur mit Sitz in Genf. 2021 haben sie sich gegründet, allerdings hat Charles schon vorher im Rahmen von äh, Forensic Oceanography ähm, äh, ähnliche Arbeit gemacht, eben auf, äh, auf die See bezogen. Ähm, ja, Grenzen wirken oft so felsenfest und unüberwindbar, aber doch verändern sich ihre Begebenheiten ständig, also durch politische Abkommen, durch Kriege, durch Krisen, aber auch Gewaltenverschiebungen, sagen wir mal, äh Frontex wird irgendwo plötzlich mehr finanziert aufgestockt und äh, so ändert sich eben auch die Grenzgewalt ständig und die Formen der Gewalt. Ähm, ja, Charles Heller wird uns genau darüber erzählen, über die Formen von Gewalt an Europas Grenzen, indirekte Gewalt wie das Sterben auf dem Mittelmeer, aber auch direkte Gewalt wie zum Beispiel Pushbacks. Und ja, ähm, jetzt überlasse ich Charles das Wort. Äh, danach wird es Zeit für Fragen geben. Vielen Dank. Danke, Alex. <lacht> Guten Abend. Danke, dass äh, Sie gekommen sind äh, durch der Schnee. Das Schnee? Wie Sie sehen, ich kann verstehen und eben ein bisschen sprechen Deutsch, aber mit einem riesen französischen Akzent. Also ich, ich bin sicher, es ist besser für alle, dass äh, ich spreche äh, Englisch. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, thanks to the organizer, to Karen, to Stefan, to Alex, to all the others for, um, for having me. Uh, it's good to be back in, in Munich. I, I've come to Munich a few times in the, in the past. In fact, I remember the first time uh, it was in 2013 in another space where we were um, presenting um, the Watch the Med platform, which was barely an idea at the time. It was a hypothesis. And well, more than 10 years later, the Watch the Med alarm phone is one of the most powerful activist uh, tools and networks um, supporting migrants uh, at sea on an everyday basis. And I am very happy to see several friends from the alarm phone um, here this evening. I know that I'm the last in a series of discussions on border violence um, across Europe. And I know that my friends from the uh, Polish Helsinki committee were here uh, last week, I believe. I spoke to them uh, since, uh, were considering collaborations as well. And so, you see, I, I think that uh, I'm happy to be part of a series exploring the transformations of border violence and what we can do uh, against them, right? Because we're seeing these trends together. We're, we're, we're facing them and all of us are wondering, what the hell can we do, right? So let's think together and this is uh, my modest contribution to this collective thinking, um, uh, to forge new tools of, of struggle. So today what I'd like to do is to share with you some of the past investigations that we've led into the changing forms of border violence at sea, specifically, 
Alex mentioned, um, I co-directed Forensic Oceanography, a project that focused on border violence at and through the sea between 2011 and 2021. Um, and I want to talk about the, these changing forms of violence at sea, the challenges that they raised, and how we thought we sought to address them through um, by forging different methodologies to document, to contest uh, these changing forms of border violence. And I want to do this, trace this arc uh, extending back in time because I think it is useful, I hope it is useful, let's see, um, to try to identify what are the challenges that we're facing today with other forms of border violence, um, in particular, in fact, on, on firm land. So I'm going to be talking about very specific investigation, particular incidents, particular shipwrecks, right? But before going into that, I think it's useful um, to start, if you will, from a, from a bird's eye perspective, um, to think about the role of borders today, right? And why borders generates such tension, such violence today. This is a, a map by uh, my friend Philippe Rukadjevic, former cartographer of uh, the Monde Diplomatique. And I think it, it captures well um, the way different border zones, particularly those demarcating the global north from the global south, have become spaces of tension, of conflict, of violence, particularly for migrants um, uh, seeking to cross between the global south and the global north. I think it's useful to, to recall Etienne Balibar's understanding of borders. Etienne Balibar is a, a French philosopher. He's about 84 now. Uh, in the early 90s, he published an article called What is a Border? It's a fascinating article that remains so important today because he was writing at the time of the transformations of European borders and I think was able to decipher some changes and implications that are still with us today. And one of the arguments of Balibar at the time was that borders are overdetermined. Well, there might be a few old Marxists in the room who might remember what overdetermination uh, means, and it might sound a bit uh, abstract to others. I think what Balibar means is simply that borders, state borders, um, the way they operate in the world is shaped by other social, political, economic, and cultural boundaries. They don't, f they don't affect all of us in the same way. In fact, in this room, I'm sure, that different people are affected in different ways by borders. When you travel, uh, maybe across Europe or elsewhere, you encounter borders differently, right? So borders are shaped by, again, the boundaries of class, of race, of citizenship, right? And in fact, I would say that today, borders function as a political technology that is used by states of the global north to police the poor, to police racialized, negatively racialized subjects on a global scale, right? So if we focus now more closely on, on Europe, of course you know that um, the consolidation of an area of freedom of movement um, for European citizens was um, conditioned by the exclusion of migrants from the global south from access to Europe, and access to freedom um, of movement. And these restrictive policies were completely at odds with the dynamics of migration established between the global south and the global north, right? Amongst others, established through European colonial expansion and recruitment of labor in the aftermath, right? And so what you have that, that emerges is what um, I refer to as a mobility conflict, a clash 
between the reality of the dynamics of migration between the global south and the global north and restrictive European policies, um, policies of closure founded on categories of race, of class, of citizenship, and that seek to keep, um, to, to prevent the right of migrants from the global south to access Europe. And even though they do access Europe, but under extremely precarious circumstances, and they remain deprived of rights, often exploited long after they have reached um, European territory. So what I'm trying to foreground here is that border violence is structural to the European migration regime, right? It is the outcome of this mobility conflict which has systemic dimensions, right? And I think we, we do need to realize that as long as the, the systemic conditions that structurally produce border violence are left unchanged, border violence will continue. It will be perpetuated. Okay, th this might seem a little bit depressing at the, the outset of the talk, and I'm very sorry to announce that, but I think we, we should know. We should know also that we're in a struggle for the long term. But you see, I'm, I'm not entirely depressed, because I think even though we know that border violence is structural, there are many things that we can do to struggle against border violence, right? And that is what we have sought to do modestly um, over the last years by developing methods to document the changing forms of border violence, to, to support demands for truth, for justice, to support litigation efforts that might maybe block at least temporarily, um, forms of border violence, right? So we know border violence, unfortunately, is here to stay, um, but there, is, there are many things that we can do to contest the violence of borders and to support migrants in the exercise of their um, freedom to move. Let me start by describing a few of the investigations into changing forms of border violence that we led um, in the Mediterranean. And as you see from this map, in fact, the Mediterranean frontier is the most deadly border zone in the world, right? According to IOM's data uh, collected as of um, 2014. Um, this figure of 25,000 people uh, who have died across the sea, uh, the, the actual figure is, is, of course, much, much uh, uh, greater. Uh, the data collected by activists, not the IOM, uh, by the United Against Racism uh, network since the early 90s documents more than 50,000 deaths at the borders of Europe. And we know that many more people um, have died with leaving as only trace the haunting absence of a loved one for their families. But nonetheless, we do know that um, the Mediterranean frontier is once again the most deadly border zone in um, the world. But when we began our work in 2011, civil society counted those deaths. They denounced those deaths as the outcome of um, fortress Europe, but they were entirely unable to document precise uh, cases of death, seek accountability, let alone intervene to prevent them. I think you, we, maybe we'll come back to that, but an alarm phone, rescue ships, counter surveillance aircrafts, this was beyond even our imagination. Um, so maybe that's another reason why I remain optimistic. Even though border deaths continue, I have seen what seemed impossible. I have seen it materialize, not once, but several times in this sequence of struggle at the borders of um, Europe. Now, the Mediterranean frontier was largely inaccessible to um, 
activists across the shores, of the many shores of the Mediterranean. And furthermore, the form of violence that we have at sea that is so deadly is primarily a form of indirect violence, right? If you look precisely at the list of United Against Racism, you will see that the primary cause of death is drowning. Not Libyan Coast Guard or Spanish Coast Guards or Greek Coast Guards shooting at people and killing them directly, even though, of course, that does happen. But the primary cause of death is drowning. The sea has been turned into um, a deadly liquid, uh, a lethal environment um, for illegalized and precaritized migrants seeking to contest um, their exclusion from um, European um, territory. And so when we started our work, this was a first challenge that we had to face. How can we document a form of violence that is indirect, that operates not only at sea, but through the sea? We have referred to this form of violence as a form of liquid violence, in which the water, the liquid element, mediates, is in between the bodies and the lives of migrants and the policies and practices of European states. Right. So when we started our work um, in 2011 in the context of uh, the Arab uprisings that led to the reopening of um, the Mediterranean frontier, first in Tunisia, then um, from Libya, as the repressed uprising um, led to a civil war and mili international military intervention against the Gaddafi regime that also led people to cross the sea as of March 2011. And unfortunately, in this context, not only was the Mediterranean being reopened after several years of near closure through policies of border externalization, but also we were seeing, once again, renewed deaths at sea. By May 2011, more than 1,500 deaths had been documented in the central Mediterranean um, just that year. But these deaths were occurring in a particular context, the context, once again, of NATO's, the NATO-led military intervention against the Gaddafi regime. Right? There were, as you can see here, on the 24th of March 2011, there were 38 warships deployed off the coast of Libya, making this the most surveyed maritime space on Earth. And there were repeated um, testimonies, indications, that um, despite the obligation of any actor at sea to rescue any person found in distress, regardless of his or her status, nationality, that NATO forces were failing in their obligation to provide assistance to any person in distress. And so a small NGO based in Paris, the GISTI, the Group of Information and Support to Immigrants, um, published this press statement in which they were announcing that they, were file, they would file a complaint against NATO, the EU, and all states taking part in the coalition. The statement was based on a very simple argument. Because of the degree of surveillance, they could not not know about the distress of these passengers, these more than 1,500 people who, were, who had just died in this space. And as a result of that knowledge, they had a responsibility to rescue, and they were failing in that obligation and guilty of the crime of non-assistance. The truth is that the Gisti had no idea how they would file a case against NATO. We know how hard uh, that is. Um, but in fact, that press statement, in a way, produced its own reality um, from the emerging, the then emerging forensic architecture project that was based, that is based at um, 
the University of Goldsmiths in London, and I was part of the, the emergence of um, that uh, project. We were developing, um, we were experimenting with new tools, new technologies to document violations and violence in many different um, contexts from uh, Israel, Palestine, to Mexico, to um, the Mediterranean. And my colleague Lorenzo Pizzani and myself thought maybe we could help. But I want to stress again that we also didn't know. We were two young PhD students, but we had a hypothesis. Maybe we could help. And the hypothesis, I think, was based on two uh, interrelated methodological moves. The first move, uh, the first hypothesis, was that, in fact, it's not true that we don't know what is happening at sea. States do know. They have deployed a vast surveillance apparatus. Through all of these sensing means, they seek to produce what they refer to as an integrated maritime picture through which they can sort between productive traffic, merchant ships, for example, and potential threats such as um, illegalized migration. And they seek to use these different means of surveillance to make migration knowable and governable, right? And we thought maybe we can use those tools of surveillance against the grain um, not to shed light on acts of unauthorized border crossing, but to shed light on the violence that states usually keep in the shadows, right? So our aim was to kind of reorient the use of those tools by exercising what we've referred to as a disobedient gaze, right? Refusing to uncover unauthorized migration, but shedding light instead on border violence. And the second hypothesis was that, in fact, it's not true either that um, the sea is a lawless space beyond the reach of state power and, and state law. In fact, as you can see uh, from here, this map, the sea is a space that is crisscrossed by multiple overlapping jurisdictions, right? It's a space of shared sovereignty um, in which uh, states do have rights as well as, as obligations. And the hypothesis that is that we might spatialize those digital traces of border violence within this political geography so as to reinscribe responsibility in what had become and what has remained, unfortunately, a space of impunity. We started to work um, on our first investigation, which is referred to as the Left to Die Boat case. A boat that left the coast of Libya on the 27th of March, 2011, and which, despite several distress calls, despite being flown over by a French military aircraft, which took this photograph, in the early uh, hours um, of the 27th of March in the early afternoon at 2 p.m. and sent this photograph to the Italian Coast Guard in Rome, along with the exact coordinates of the passengers, despite being overflown by two military helicopters, despite coming in vicinity to a large warship, they were abandoned to drift for 14 days and only nine people survived when their boat landed back on uh, Libyan soil. We began to investigate this, this case, which is, as you, as you see, precisely one of those cases of killing without touching. Nobody shot at these people, right? This is a form of violence in which action and inaction blur and which is no less lethal for that. How could we register that violence? We began by interviewing some of the nine survivors. Here you see an image of a 
testimony by Dan Haile Gebre. Um, we then collected other elements of evidence to corroborate their testimony and understand the practices of actors around them. This photograph, but also uh, distress signals that contain exact georeference coordinates. We called upon an oceanographer to model the boat's drift from the moment it ran out of fuel on the basis of wind and current data. As you see, this is a form of liquid violence, but the sea could also be brought to testify for how it had been made to kill. And so we knew the boat's trajectory. We knew as a result of this distress signal that all vessels in the area were informed of the boat's distress and position. The question then became, where were the 38 warships that were deployed at the time? And to try and answer that question, we use satellite imagery, um, which has a relatively low resolution of 75 meters, meaning that every pixel in this image corresponds to 75 meters. And large warships that would be beyond 75 meters up to 150, even 200 meters would appear as one or two pixels. We can't identify uh, the, 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 the nationality or um, the identity of each of these uh, ships. But we can say that there were a number of ships in vicinity to the drifting boat at the time this image was taken. So the, the, the position of the boat is indicated here in yellow. The closest vessels were located less than two hours away from the passengers and could have rescued them uh, very uh, easily. On the basis of these different methods, we thus reconstructed the trajectory of the vessel and the interactions with um, a number of state actors. And our report was the basis for um, several legal cases against um, Italy, France, Belgium, and Spain. Several of these cases have been closed since, but in fact, um, the legal case in France has recently been reopened and is still um, ongoing. And so the demand for truth, for justice of the survivors of Abu Kurke, of Dan Haile Gebre, who I recently spoke to uh, again, their demand for justice continues, but I can, as you might imagine, with absolutely no illusion, more than 10 years after the fact, their demand for truth and justice continues to be um, denied, Despa despite the evidence that we gathered pointing to very strong responsibility of all state actors present in the area at the time. But what I'm trying to foreground here with this first investigation is the way we had to try to develop new methods to account for forms of violence that are indirect, right? A form of violence, a form of killing without touching, right? And in the years that followed, we had to trace violence even further in space and time. For example, in our Deaths by Rescue report, which focused no longer on practices of non-assistance by vessels in vicinity, as in the Left to Die Boat case, but on the veritable policy of non-assistance implemented by the EU in ending um, the Italian Mare Nostrum operation. What we showed in this report is that um, while the Mare Nostrum operation had deployed its vessels very close to the Libyan coast and proactively rescued um, passengers in uh, distress, when Italy sought the support of its European counterparts to Europeanize Mare Nostrum, these denied, calling it a pull factor. Sounds familiar? Instead of Europeanizing Mare Nostrum, they deployed a Frontex-led operation with a much more limited um, operational perimeter and a completely different operational logic. Border control rather than proactive rescue 
was um, its aim. And you can see here the two zones um, overlap. And what our report shows is that they implemented this policy shift, this operational shift, in full knowledge of the certain lethal outcomes that this um, shift would have. These, uh, these warnings were voiced across the human rights community, but also, in fact, um, within Frontex's internal documents. For example, you see here from a document from August 2014, when this operational shift was still being negotiated, the withdrawal of naval assets from the area, if not properly planned and announced well in advance, would likely result in a higher number of fatalities. Despite those warnings, they implemented this policy shift, in effect, creating a lethal rescue gap. So you see, this was no longer about um, practices of non-assistance in which, again, a boat in vicinity, as in the left-to-die boat, fails to assist passengers they may see, right? Rather, it was a policy shift that aimed to retreat European naval assets far away from the areas that migrants were crossing to make their crossings more difficult, but also, of course, more dangerous and so that European vessels would never be called upon to operate rescue. Some of you in this room may remember the mobilization in Germany against Klaus Rössler, who wrote to the Italian Coast Guard saying, I'm, I'm paraphrasing and uh, being more clear than his torturous technocratic uh, language, but basically, please don't call on Frontex ships to operate rescue. That's not what we're here for. And in effect, this rescue gap led to a staggering increase in um, border deaths, in particular um, in the two largest shipwrecks of recent Mediterranean history. On the 12th of April, more than 400 people died. On the 18th of April, 2015, more than 950 people died. One of my friends of um, the alarm phone, Hatem Geribi, um, would often say, you know, trying to, to just try to realize what 950 people is. And he would say, look, sometimes I, I walk in the streets. He, he lived in Strasbourg. Um, he lives in Strasbourg. Um, I walk in the streets. I look at a, a crowded pedestrian area. And I try to think how many people are here. What does 900 people, what does it, can we even start to imagine what 950 people looks like? And 950 people should be multiplied several fold to account for the violence th of the loss to their families across the world. In fact, in the wake of these shipwrecks, no less than Jean-Claude Juncker, at the time the president of the European Commission, admitted that it was a serious mistake to bring the Mare Nostrum operation to an end. It cost human lives. Now we would contest the qualification of this policy shift as a mistake. It was implemented in full knowledge of its lethal consequences. Nonetheless, this is the president of the European Commission admitting that a change in public policy cost human lives. You expect that someone's gonna go to jail, someone's gonna be fired. In fact, the next sentence in Jean-Claude Juncker's, Juncker's statement is announcing the tripling of Frontex's budget. Frontex, the agency that had lobbied over that entire summer to end the Mare Nostrum um, operation. What I'm trying to foreground here is the challenge of registering 
forms of indirect violence, right, that operate without touching, and as you see from the left to die both case to the ending of Mare Nostrum, at different spatial and temporal scales, right? This was a veritable policy of non-assistance, right? But across the Mediterranean, we see border violence with the dimension of distance, also in other respects, which are maybe less spatial, but also processual in the terms of the, the actors involved. And we see this very clearly um, with the practices of pushback across um, the Mediterranean, the central Mediterranean in um, particular. Now, to understand the shifts over since 2011, it's very important to return to this practice. This, as you can see, is a black man in 2009 being forcefully disembarked from an Italian border patrol ship in the port of Tripoli as a result of the agreements with the Berlusconi, between the Berlusconi government and the Gaddafi regime. Berlusconi had uh, summarized that agreement with uh, more oil and less migrants. Now, Italy was condemned by the European Court of Human Rights in 2012 in its hearsay judgment. And the hearsay judgment said that even though people had been intercepted on the high seas, they had come on board an Italian ship and thus Italy had the responsibility, was bound by its jurisdiction um, not to push back people, right, to Libya. So after several years of practices and policy of non uh, policies of non-assistance, when Italy and the EU um, embarked on what we refer to as the Mare Clausum operation, they decided to do everything uh, they possibly could to block migrants' crossings across the central Mediterranean, criminalizing solidarity on the one hand, but also re-erecting the Libyan Coast Guard by training them, by signing political agreements, by um, refurbishing, repairing, or donating new vessels, such as this one, which was uh, brought to the Libyan Coast Guard um, by Marco Miniti uh, himself at the time in um, May 2017. It's important to remember that Marco Miniti is from the Italian Democratic Party, and he was the veritable architect of this policy of refoulement by proxy, not Matteo um, Salvini. Italy deployed a warship in the port of Tripoli that serves as a communication center for the, the Libyan Coast Guard. Italy, funded by the EU, supported the Libyan Coast Guard in declaring its search and rescue area so that violent interceptions, rescue at gunpoint, as we refer to them, could be framed as legitimate rescue operations. And in this way, Italy and the EU erected a system of delegated pushbacks to Libya, right? And the aim, it, it's really simply taking the hearsay judgment and using it as a manual. We got condemned for taking migrants on board our vessel. We're going to push them back without our assets, our personnel, ever um, coming into direct contact with the bodies of migrants. This is what's happening exactly in this image. This is an Italian um, warship, the Andrea Doria. It had spotted a boat in distress. It waited at the distance until the Libyan Coast Guard vessel that you see in the foreground arrives. It even handed over life jackets. If you look closely at some of these images, the, passenger, the life jackets have Italian insignia on them. And these people were among the dozens of thousands of people that have been brought back to Libya to what is increasingly described 
equ equally by um, UN human rights agencies as uh, a situation of crimes against humanity in Libya. And we try to contest, to document and contest this policy as well. Um, we worked with Sea Watch in 2017 and using the footage that the Sea Watch had collected, um, we documented a, a particular incident of partly failed interception and pushback to Libya, which was the basis for um, uh, a legal complaint against Italy that is still pending in front of the European Court of Human Rights. Despite this legal complaint, where, which you always hope would act as a deterrent for states, they know that they're being watched and maybe they'll be more careful in operating their uh, policy. In fact, um, the policy and practice of refoulement by proxy was deepened. And the distance that we see at work, you see it's a distance this time, uh, a, a, a mediation, right? Between different actors, again, between the bodies of migrants and the s European state actors. That distance was filled with further actors, such as um, merchant ships, in another case that we documented, the Nivin incident, where migrants were uh, rescued by the Nivin, um, but that was then tasked by the Italian Coast Guard and um, the Libyan Coast Guard to bring the migrants back to Misrata. During 10 days, the migrants occupied the hold of the ship, refusing to disembark until they were forcefully disembarked by um, the Libyan Coast Guard. We also supported uh, litigation efforts in this case as well. In addition to an increasing number of mediating actors, Italy and the EU further increased the distance vertically, if you will, by deploying as well an increasing number of um, aircraft, surveillance aircraft, to patrol um, the, the coast of Libya even as they withdrew further their naval assets. An aircraft is a pretty ideal solution, right? You don't even need to have uh, a naval asset in vicinity to the coast that could always be called upon to rescue, and an aircraft cannot operate rescue, right? It simply monitors from the sky, informs the Libyan Coast Guard um, so that they um, intercept migrants in distress. In the investigation that we've led as border forensics that Giovanna Reder, uh, Lorenzo Pezzani, Jack Isels, our team focusing on um, uh, Frontex aerial surveillance, they have analyzed very carefully the role of Frontex drones in the central Mediterranean, mapping its tracks with precision. And they have demonstrated, our team at Border Forensics has demonstrated that more than one third of the 32,000 people who were intercepted by the Libyan Coast Guard and pulled back to Libya in 2021 only, one third of these people were intercepted as a result of a Frontex aerial sighting. Contrary to Frontex, to what Frontex argues, Frontex is not contributing to rescue. Usually they will not inform uh, either merchant ships or NGOs in the vicinity. They will try to enable instead Libyan Coast Guard interceptions. Ladinos, who was a Sudanese man and poet who was trying to cross from Libya and who died attempting to cross the sea in 2020, talks in his poems, which the alarm phone has translated, um, talks in, in his poems ab about the violence that he and others, in particular black people in Libya, are subjected to as a wheel of destruction, crushing their bodies. But what I'm trying to foreground here is that this wheel of destruction isn't limited to Libyan territory. 
the mechanisms of this wheel are spreading across the Mediterranean to offices in Rome, to the European Commission, to Frontex's offices in Warsaw. This is a wheel, several wheels uh, locked together, operating across the sea. But that together are resulting in the crushing, the destruction of black people's bodies and lives in Libya. What I'm trying to foreground here, again, are the methodological challenge that we face. How do you document violence that is indirect? Indirect because it is mediated by water. Indirect because it operates by creating a, a rescue back. Indirect because it involves ever, ever more actors in this wheel of destruction. And this was a trend that we um, observe this growing distance in the perpetration of border violence that we observed at sea, but that one can observe as well in other border zones that we've been working on um, since. For example, we have um, published a report on the effects of uh, the anti-smuggling law in uh, Niger, the 2015 law, which has just recently been uh, abrogated. That law, for the more than eight years that it was uh, implemented, it criminalized migrants and those who supported them, and it forced them to head ever further into the desert, away from the main road running from Agadez to the borders of Libya. And in doing this, we demonstrated through satellite imagery analysis that it was pushing uh, migrants' trajectories ever further away from the road. We, we were able to compare satellite imagery in, f in several different areas. And in doing this, it was pushing them ever further beyond um, a thresh the threshold of dehydration. Areas if when a truck breaks down, um, the passengers will have little to no chance of uh, reaching the road again or water points um, again. So here too, you have at once a process of European border externalization, indirect in terms of the actors, but also indirect in that it is here not the sea, but the desert that is turned into a hostile environment. So those are some of the challenges that we face in documenting indirect forms of border violence. But we face other challenges as well in different other um, borders of Europe um, where we are um, working as border forensics. Think of these Croatian border guards at the Croatia-Bosnia border. They're beating, at times torturing, the migrants they intercept. They are doing so very directly in the form of violence. They're doing so as Croatian border guards. And they are doing so on Croatian territory. So you see, th these this multi-dimensional distance that we had at work in the forms of violence that we uh, struggled to document over the years. Here, you can see that this distance has collapsed. Just think of um, Hungary. Of course, it, it, it may be an extreme example, but you know these are pushbacks at the Hungarian border. And as Andreas uh, Lederer of the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, look, usually states would do everything they can to hide their pushback practices. No. Hungary enshrines pushbacks into its national legislation and keeps official statistics, which it publishes mon monthly. Now, you see, Italy... Now, I, I've spent more than 10 years fighting Italian policies, supporting litigation efforts 
But in retrospect, Italy, in a sense, is relatively well-behaved. Why? Because what Italy has been trying to do is to operate pushbacks without getting caught. That means it still considers European norms, jurisprudence, the Hearsay case, as important points of reference. Hungary absolutely doesn't care. They, they don't care if they get caught. They have been condemned by the European Court of Justice, by the European Court of um, Human Rights. And I think that we're really seeing a trend towards the brutalization and the normalization of border violence across increasing um, areas of the external borders of Europe. You see this kind of second C that Frontex um, considers in what it describes as joint operation Terra. For me, this is an incredibly important map. It's pointing that, in fact, the entire space ranging from Greece to Finland is considered as a transnational space of border crossing and border reinforcing, just like the Mediterranean is as well. And across many of these borders, we see again this trend to extremely direct violence perpetrated brutally, perpetrated by EU actors, perpetrated often on um, European soil. I see that um, I'm now slowly running out of time, so I should um, uh, not be too much longer, but I, I can try to conclude um, in, in a few more minutes. I want to try and conclude um, on the one hand by maybe foregrounding why I think this trend is happening um, and hint at possibilities to think about together about what might be done to contest this trend, which of course is putting many of our standard rep practices, our repertoire of action into crisis, right? I mean, what does it really serve to document um, pushbacks in Hungary if there are state statistics counting them, right? What does it serve when uh, Hungary um, has enshrined uh, pushbacks into its legislation? What does litigation serve when the European Court of Human Rights um, le legitimizes pushbacks in Spain across the Moroccan uh, Spanish fences? So what's going on and what can we do about it? I'll be extremely uh, brief, but I think that the brutalization of border violence is that we're witnessing is essentially a response by European states to the power of migration that they witnessed over 2015, to the summer of migration, as uh, you all recall in Munich in um, particular. Essentially, if border externalization had been one of the main trends, and I would say, in fact, one of the few points of consensus of European policymaking, you see, they could not agree on anything between European states, except the fundamental aim of keeping migrants out at all and any cost, right? And so border externalization has been one of the few points of consensus between European states. But really, a growing Europe number of European states realized that actually no amount of border externalization would be sufficient to prevent migrants from reaching European territory. And so border externalization was somehow predicated that to prevent access to territory, which entailed access to rights, you had to involve an ever-growing number of actors beyond European territory. Well, here, what European states are doing in practice for some, in policy or in jurisprudence, is somehow turning the tables. They're trying to severe 
that connection, to cut that connection between access to territory and access to rights. You can access Greek territory, Hungarian territory, Polish territory, but you won't access rights. You can be pushed back either formally or informally. So what can we do in the face of this um, trend? How can we understand it? How can we document it? How can we contest it? Should we just give up since simply exposing more border violence seems to have but become uh, useless or nearly useless? Of course, I don't believe we should draw that conclusion. But I, I do think we need to stare carefully at um, the current situation. Um, and we need to acknowledge that some of our forms of, of action are simply no longer working. They're no longer allowing us to block and contest border violence um, effectively. I want to share a few last notes and slides concerning one of these external borders in which we're seeing brutal practices and the approach that we're experimenting with um, at uh, present. The Nador Melia border, which you see here, and which I'm sure as many of you know, was the theater of a veritable massacre on the 24th of June, 2022. More than 1,500 people tried to cross those fences, and they were channeled to a border post where, where they were stuck in a trap between Spanish border guards that prevented them from um, crossing and pushed them back, and then Moroccan border guards, which systematically beat them, many of them to death. Several dozens people died, many more remain disappeared to this day. Not only has there not been justice for this crime, but in fact, um, many of the survivors on Moroccan territory are now lying in Moroccan prisons for, uh, with penalties from three to five years, as they are accused of having uh, committed acts of violence. Now, even if we are reconstructing very, very, very precisely the exact unfolding of the events over that day, and so those practices of direct violence, it seems to us just as important to analyze and reconstruct the conditions that made that extreme violence possible. This means, for example, um, analyzing everyday racism at this border over years, which targets disproportionately black people who are forced to camp in the forest and who are forced as well to cross the fences and who are disproportionately affected by violence and death. It means as well to reconstruct, as we are doing, um, the changing diplomatic relations between Morocco, Spain, and the EU, which we know, in fact, shape the intensity, the varying intensity of violence at that border. If Spain, say, greets um, a representative of Western Sahara, the next day, Morocco lets people pass. If Spain or the EU make a few concessions on Western Sahara, for example, amongst other levels of negotiation, they will immediately crack down and demonstrate their willingness to repress um, migrants. What I'm trying to suggest here as one methodological approach that we are experimenting with is that in documenting these brutal direct practices of border violence, we can't remain um, with, let's say, a focus on nasty and brutal border guards even though we do need to document their practices. We need, paradoxically, in relation to these direct practices, here too, 
we need to reconstruct the broader processes, conditions, political, legal, that make those brutal practices possible. And we need to hold all of those different actors, we need to hold them to account. As I was um, concluding this, um, preparing this presentation, I was thinking back to um, um, this passage um, from um, the book uh, Forensic Aesthetics by A.L. Weitzman, uh, who's the director of forensic architecture, a friend and mentor, and uh, Matthew Fuller. And there's something very important methodologically here in this passage that I want to read. In legal settings, it is only proximate, direct causes that count in coming to a determination of a cause of guilt. This can be called the requirement for minimal causation. The complex, multiple causes, which may be social, cultural, economic, environmental, and so on, that bear on a particular event, what we call field causality, an ecology of actors, of causes, intertwined, operating across space and time. What we called field causality are discounted in such legal settings or heard only as mitigating circumstances. Counter-investigations, as we seek to operate, they try to work both with minimal causation and field causality to study the mechanics of an incident, of an act of police shooting, perhaps, and do so within the constraints of a time-space. But to counter for counter-investigations, violence is also always larger and more pervasive than the cordoned off area of a crime scene. So what Eyal is suggesting in this passage is that we need to combine the analysis of direct violence with um, the broader enabling conditions that may be cultural, legal, political, and operate across different scales, and again, lead all the way back to um, European policy uh, offices or courts. I'm thinking just uh, um, now of um, a text by uh, John Berger, which we should all maybe return to um, in these times. It's called uh, Written in the Night. And in that text, in one passage, he says something like, there is an increasing relation between minutes of meetings and minutes of agony. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that we need to document and to counter direct brutal practices. We need to reconstruct these multiple chains of causality far beyond uh, the immediate practices of violence and seek accountability as well at all those different um, levels. That's at least the, um, the hypothesis that we are uh, following and that of course I'd, I'd want to think and discuss uh, with all of you, a hypothesis we're thinking about um, within the border forensics uh, research and investigation agency, but also that um, I'll, I will start to develop within a research project um, titled The Circumference of Violence, which um, will be based at the, the University of Bern. And I will stop here for, for now and hope to, to think with you about um, what possible strategies we can develop, of course, together. Thank you so much, Charles, for the talk. Um, and yeah, the very, very um, variety of uh, research we have seen. Uh, I might maybe uh, ask you one question and then we open to the audience. Um, so I was wondering how, if you can explain to us how this forensic work is actually developing. I imagine it's a huge effort and is it, um, and how you access this data and how you process the data you're putting in these um, 
spatial uh, visuali visualizations and um, yeah, um, uh, how do you say um, graphics you are you are uh, producing? I mean, every single case of violence involves different methods, different forms of evidence. Um, and I guess that's in relation to any situation of violence, we ask, first of all, what may have happened? At the outset of an investigation, we don't fully know. We maybe have a few fragments of evidence to start with. Um, we also usually have, as a result of our extensive research in, in border areas, we do nonetheless know how actors operate, right? We understand their logics, their, their patterns of practice. And so we can formulate on the basis of those fragments of evidence and our understanding of patterns of practice, we can formulate a hypothesis in terms of what may have happened. Um, but then the second question that we ask, well, in this uh, chain of events that at the outset is again hypothetical, what technologies, what methodologies might allow to register traces of these unfolding events? And each time, the answer to that question is different. At times, we have hours of footage. At times, we have no images at all. Um, and each, each investigation uh, demands that we, that we forge really specific uh, methods and tools uh, that are adapted to, to each context. I've tried to share a few uh, during the, the presentation, but maybe uh, taking one example, um, the, the Niger case. Nobody knows how many people die in Niger, in the Sahara. Nobody knows, despite the tireless work of networks such as uh, the Alarm Phone Sahara or Alternative Espace Citoyen in, in Niger. This is such a vast space. It's extremely difficult to, to document. So how could we document the effects, the, the lethal effects of, um, of border control if we don't even know how many people are dying? To try and answer that challenge, we entered into a discussion that lasted several months uh, before we began the investigation with researchers and activists focusing on the US-Mexico border, an other desertic landscape which has been turned into a lethal borderscape as a result of US uh, policies of closure. And we worked with these researchers and activists to adapt their methods to the context of uh, Niger. So this is just one example, but each investigation demands that we yeah, forge um, specific tools to, to register the violence, and then we cross-reference all of the elements that we gather um, and locate them in space and time. Yes, uh, so the, the, da the data you access is uh, mostly like publicly accessible data that you um, work with? Yes. Again, there too, it, it really depends. We use everything we can, but if it's not accessible, we'll always ask, well, how can we get it? Uh, so we'll file freedom of information requests. Though, you know, transparency, uh, European transparency, increasingly looks like a blacked out document uh, these days. Or we will, we will go to the field with our, with our teams and uh, interview, um, oh, uh, I wanted to show, uh, yeah, whatever. Um, we, will, we were interviewing some 30 survivors uh, of the Nador Melilla massacre, right? That those testimonies are of course not uh, publicly um, available. Um, so we rely both on publicly available um, material as well as uh, on other evidence that we need to gather and other evidence that we generate. Let's take the example of the, the wind and current data. In and of itself, wind and current data 
isn't that useful. But if used by an oceanographer, it could model the trajectory of the boats and produce new evidence that did not exist either in public or in, in the non-public uh, realm. Okay, one uh, third question <laughs> to, to sum this up with the Niger case. Uh, I would love to know, uh, because you were speaking about EU involvement in, in these uh, changing of laws that made actually um, people and also smugglers um, change their routes to more lethal routes. Um, what kind of measures were taken there and how was the EU involved in that? directly the EU institutions but also European member states including Germany including France and others um, since migrants crossing from Libya were amongst others transiting through Niger um, they decided that they had to pressure Niger to prevent those crossings in fact um, one Italian official was stating very openly, the borders uh, of Europe are south of Libya, right? So that's where you need to stop people from uh, crossing. So the EU pressured the government of Niger. The government of Niger also, of course, had its own uh, interests, right? It used as well to its own interest this unequal uh, relation, also for funding, uh, for for other diplomatic um, uh, negotiations. Um, but in this way, they Niger uh, instituted a law, the 2015 um, law, that criminalized the support um, and the transport of migrants. Up to 2015, 2016, there was a, a bus stop in Agadez just, just, just imagine any bus stop, large international bus stop in Munich or in any other German city. You go to the bus stop, you buy your ticket, you hop on the bus, and off you go. It was exactly the same in Nagadez. There were lists of passengers, right? But that law criminalized the support and the transport of migrants, and it forced that whole economy of transport underground, and it forced it to force them to resort to ever further routes to avoid um, border controls, and this proved uh, lethal for uh, migrants seeking to transit uh, through Niger. Hat jemand schon eine Frage? Um, ihr könnt sie auch gerne auf Deutsch stellen, weil Charles meistens alles ganz gut versteht. <laughs> If not, I can... Ah, there is one here. Uh, should we... What, how... We okay, that's how we do it. Yes, uh, bitte. Um, genau, ich wiederhole sie dann einfach noch mal, die Frage. Thank you. 
of Emma, the Lutheran Christian woman, in song, has renewed our pride in a passion that is as dramatic as the one that she wrote in the Aeneid. And so my question is, how do you write a song about Emma? I mean, how do you renew a song about your own passion, your own love for music? Okay, vielleicht wiederhole ich es nochmal für, oder ich versuche es zusammenzufassen. I try to sum it up. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so that would also be a question for me and maybe for others what refoulement by proxy actually means um, because I don't understand this French word. Um, and uh, you were referring to that and the basic question was if there were any verdicts, any uh, urteile um, concerning European um, border violence uh, done by actually other actors that are not directly European and if they are held accountable for that um, and you were bringing up the example of uh, the US um, Rammstein base where there was a, a kind of a verdict about Germany being still accountable for what happens there. So, your answer. Thanks for that. Um, I'll, I'll share this with um, this idea with um, the legal teams that we, um, that we work with. Um, but let me share what, or try to summarize what their reasoning has been um, until now. Um, first, refoulement by proxy. Other terms that have been used and forged are, for example, uh, contactless uh, control, um, amongst others by a lawyer and legal scholar um, we worked with, Violetta Moreno-Lax, uh, but also others, Itamar Mann. Um, so look, 2017, we see this practice emerging. We brought 15, 20 uh, rescue NGOs, lawyers from different uh, countries, investigators, and we tried to come together and think, what can we do? What can we do to document this? And how can we seek accountability? And every single, all of this was very difficult and problematic. Documenting the, the impact of this policy of refoulement by proxy was extremely difficult. First, because NGOs were being criminalized. So they were being pushed out of the sea also to prevent them from exercising a civilian right to look at sea. Second, once migrants are intercepted and brought back to Libya, it's nearly impossible to um, reestablish contact with them, right? In this case, we were able to do so because half the passengers in the Sea Watch case that I showed, half the passengers were rescued by Sea Watch, brought to Italy, and they could reestablish contact with those who had been brought back to Libya. And we also met them after they reattempted to cross. So documenting was the first challenge. And the second challenge was, of course, Italy had designed this policy not to get caught. That was the point. So what legal argument could be formulated to, if you will, follow Italy in its practice and reinscribe responsibility? Um, now, if you put even two lawyers in a room, you're, you're sure to have a, a disagreement. 10 lawyers, they, they all disagree. 
um, it was really challenging. Um, the argument that the lawyers who filed the case against Italy on the basis of our report formulated in the end is based on hearsay. So the argument in hearsay is because the, the migrants came on board the Italian patrol ship, Italy exercised effective control. And effective control entailed jurisdiction. So the argument that the legal team has formulated is similar, if you will. Even though the migrants no longer come on board um, Italian ships, as a result of the different, the, the layers of collaboration, of funding, of political agreements, of coordination, right, which we saw, in effect, even though migrants are no longer coming on board Italian ships, they are still under the effective control of Italy and Europe. The Libyan Coast Guard could not operate those interceptions and bring people back to Libya without that multi-form cooperation, coordination, um, and ultimately, um, control. And in that way, coming back to your, your question as well about refoulement by, uh, by proxy, Italy is breaching, and the EU is are breaching the obligation to allow people under their jurisdiction to seek asylum, and they are bringing them back or sending them back to a country in which their lives are at risk. In fact, in which we are certain that uh, they will be submitted to torture, to exploitation, to slavery um, in multiple forms. So that is the argument that the legal team um, has formulated. The case is still pending. It's pending at the European Court of Human Rights since 2018. So four years, and that is also one of the limits of um, litigation because we know litigation efforts take years. And during that time, well, states can continue to perpetrate violence and they can partly change the reality on the ground um, until they uh, potentially um, meet the sanction of the law. There have also been cases in Italy um, that have been have reached interesting and rather rights upholding um, jurisprudence, but I, I would not be able to go into the detail of them. It's you know rather technical, um, uh, just uh, li like this. We have another question uh, and a louder question. Uh, I saw your face. A partly rhetorical question I hear is, um, <laughs> yeah, what if if uh, the border violence is already documented so well, like the in the best f uh, way, like it has never been documented before? If we all know about this, if even if I might add, uh, Hungary is documenting their own pushbacks, if everyone has this information um, available, 
uh, but there is no um, reaction in yeah in changing these realities. What is your work actually good for? Thanks, Karim. <laughs> Um, now, we ask ourselves that question, and we have to ask ourselves that question. I think, in fact, we should all be asking ourselves that question, and we are. This is a question that is on the minds of many human rights activists focusing on uh, migrants' rights, um, including in important discussions that uh, uh, Medico Proazil have been joining over the last uh, months. Um, I would want to answer through by going back to this concept that I, I referred to very briefly, but which for us has been a bit of a, a political compass in our, wor in our work, which is this concept of the disobedient gaze, right? <laughs> Attempt to reveal what states are trying to conceal and not to reveal what they seek to, to reveal. It's really simple, but actually it's incredibly, one, difficult, and two, it's never the same. So even in the cases that I just showed, that I just shared, uh, I, I did not s s go in so much detail into that case, but when we investigated the death by rescue, why was the report's title Death by Rescue, you might ask? It was titled Death by Rescue because those two shipwrecks of the 12th and the 18th of April both occurred at the moment merchant ships were attempting to rescue the passengers. They were doing everything they could to rescue them. So if, as investigators, we focused on the space-time of death, the immediate vicinity, there's no violation, right? They di the, the merchant ships, they didn't fail in their obligation to assist migrants, they, they tried. But that scale was totally insufficient because we knew that in fact merchant ships in the first months of 2015, became the top, the number one search and rescue actor. They were rescuing more migrants than any other actor in the central Mediterranean because they were called upon to fill the rescue gap. On the 31st of March, 2015, days before those shipwrecks, the, the Chamber of Shipping, wrote a letter to the EU Commission, to the Council, saying, we are ready to operate rescue, but we're not equipped to do so. These are the most difficult rescue operations that you can imagine. You saw, you saw this merchant ship, the king, let's take this one. How can you ask a cargo ship that may measure more than 100 meters to maneuver to rescue a completely overcrowded boat. So we knew that they had filled, they, they had been forced to fill the rescue gap that had been created by those broader policies. And we had to make that broader operational shift that was kept invisible, right? Matteo Renzi at the time, 18th of April, traffickers, the slave traders of the 21st century, bring them to court, right? We, we had to say no. We need to shift the, the focus spatially and temporally, and we need to reveal what you are still keeping in the shadows and which made those shipwrecks inevitable. So, you see, I'm just giving this example of how a disobedient gaze needs to reposition itself constantly. And I think it's exactly the same that we need to do uh, today. Let's take the examples that you're somehow referring to. Let's think of Hungary. Let's think of uh, Greece. 
or Poland. The first thing I think we need to acknowledge is that even though there is a trend that is common, it's also not everywhere the same. So Greece, it has a de facto policy, but it's not enshrined in its legislation. And it still says, no, we never done it. So that's not the same. Greece is still trying to hide. So it's still important that we, that we reveal. And actually, uh, in the weeks that followed the Pilos shipwreck, with large public pressure in Greece, across Europe, there was a decrease in pushbacks. The public mobilization uh, following the Coutro shipwreck in Italy earlier uh, this year also uh, had some kind of effect. So what I'm saying is that we need to understand what states are seeking to reveal and conceal and position ourselves tactically in relation to that. Hungary, can we do nothing there? Well, Hungary under Orban is not exactly easy to sway. So, because I practices were so blatant, Frontex had to suspend its direct support to the border guards. But Frontex is still in Hungary, and the, the, op the, the joint operations that were led by Frontex are now led by Austria and other European states. They've bilateralized the joint operations. So if, if Orban is not so easy to sway, well, we need to show the complicity of Austria, of those other states, and maybe we can use those weak, demo still democratic links um, to pressure them. So I guess that would be my, my tentative answer, but hey, if we have the, the answer, we're all looking for that answer, but that would be the direction in which I would want uh, to think, to use the disobedient gaze and to ask in each context, what are they revealing, but what are they concealing? And so that's where we need to, uh, to concentrate our, our efforts. Um, I'm starting in English. There's no bad question. So you are asking for other um, how it could look differently in a more um, in a less violent way the border. Yeah. So how? Yeah. Also, wie könnte es uh, sozusagen? Um, dazu kommen, dass eigentlich Charles Hellers Arbeit sich überflüssig macht, dass es äh, keine ähm, Grenzgewalt mehr gibt, Charles. Thanks a lot for that excellent question. And in fact, we, we absolutely need to ask that question again and again. Um, and we need to ask it again again and uh, again because it's essential, um, but also because maybe when the context changes, it might receive a different answer as well. Um, I would say two things. Um, the first thing, I would come back to what I, I started with. Border violence is a structural outcome of this mobility conflict, which, has, which is shaped by deep systemic conditions of global inequality, of racism, and as long as those systemic conditions that produce and reproduce 
the mobility conflict are left unchanged, then we know that border violence will continue. It might be, um, some of its modalities might be contested, might be interrupted, but it will adapt. And it, the hearsay case is the perfect example. But wait a minute. The hearsay case is also a, a positive example. There were no more pushbacks across the central Mediterranean between 2011 and 2017. That's a success. It's a temporary success, but it's a success. It's a success that is worth it for every single person that was able to cross over that time. Let's, let's hold on to the small victories um, where, we, where we can. But we know, and again, the way Italy adapted its practice to the hearsay judgment again confirms that. As long as the broader conditions that reproduce violence are not themselves addressed, uh, border violence will continue. So where does that leave us? How do we get to that point where borders no longer generate violence, where borders might become um, in, maybe cease to exist, or become, uh, in the words of Edouard Glissant, spaces of passage and transformation rather than horizons of the impossible. Um, I would say that uh, we need to mobilize different tools and strategies of struggle that also operate at different temporalities and spatialities. So documentation and litigation is one modest tool, one amongst many others. Other extraordinary tools, such as the alarm phone, such as rescue NGOs, offer direct support to migrants during their, their crossings. They're absolutely essential. The forms of activism that I'm sure many of you in this room engage with every day they're essential. They're essential because the violence of borders doesn't stop at the border. That's another lesson of Etienne Balibar and that is unfortunately verified every day. The border is an institution, right? It divides between citizens and non-citizens, right? And the categories that it's shaped by um, further crystallize across the territory. The border can be in a train or in a bus or in a, uh, a metro in uh, Munich when people are racially profiled, checked uh, for their tickets and exposed to the risk of deportation, right? So the work that you all do here is absolutely essential um, as well. In fact, I want to say that every time we establish relations across the boundaries of race, of class, of citizenship, the borders in the Mediterranean vacillate. They're weakened temporarily because those borders are founded on those categories, right? So Frontex, they, they like this concept of integrated border management. They call it IBM. Border control has to operate before, at, across, and after the border. Well, there is something like an integrated border solidarity. It doesn't have any central command in any country, and certainly not in Varsal. Um, but nonetheless, it too, we too, our practices operate before, at, across, and after the border. And if we are being criminalized in our solidarity, it's because we are affected. It's because we are a threat to the EU's policies of closure. So all of those practices are essential. But we also need to link up the migrant solidarity movement, the migrants' rights movement, with struggles for global justice, with struggles against racism, with struggles for environmental justice, 
that, you might say, makes the struggle more complicated, right? Um, but it also means that migration, the, the very trajectories of migrants and the different borders, forms of oppression that they encounter, has a tremendous potential to, to be a kind of node uh, for intersectional and transversal struggles. So that's my, my tentative uh, answer. Also eher ein Kommentar, den ich mal zusammenfasse. Ähm, Sie haben auf die Widersprüche hingewiesen, auf die man vielleicht auch mehr schauen sollte, dass eben ähm, jetzt laut Ihrer Recherche 1,4 Millionen ähm, Immigrantinnen gebraucht werden würden, um sozusagen die, es bezieht sich auf EU, oder? Auf Deutschland. Äh, genau, aber ich, ah ja, okay. Ähm, Ökonomen würden äh, sagen das. Und ähm, gleichzeitig eben dieses äh, Grenzregime, was da sozusagen auf Festung Europa ähm, zielt. Ähm, ja, Charles, is there, I mean, we are seeing uh, the tightening of asylum laws and border uh, regime. We are seeing that most of the EU states are very far from what you are um, trying to argue for. Um, but still there is this need of immigration and you were voicing also the being cautious about the utilita 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 utilitaristischen oh God, um, approach to this uh, discussion that it could be um, yeah, also dehumanizing to say which people do we need, which do we not need in Europe. Um, but is there a way to address this more on a political level um, and is there a perspective that this tightening of the EU border regimes uh, could be reduced. Thanks for that. Well, uh, all challenging questions and we were starting to think together. I, I will not have uh, the, the answer to, uh, to all of these um, challenging questions, but I'll, I'll try to think with it um, briefly. I'd start by saying that precisely border regimes, they always involve multiple actors. It's not just states and their exclusionary logics versus migrants. It's also NGOs, it's fishermen, it's merchant ships. So I'm, I'm still in the field here. But it's a very good example of how um, you have these multiple actors with different logics who can be um, moved across the spectrum, across uh, border crossing, 
and border reinforcing, right? Again, the merchant ships that we've discussed, 2014, 2015, they are our ally. The, the, chain, the European Chamber of Shipping calling, like rescue NGOs, for the reestablishment of proactive st Europe state-led search and rescue. That's really interesting. They're, they're rescuing people. So merchant ships who, in principle, would have nothing to do with or against migration become an important actor. But they have also been pulled to the other side, tasked with rescue and then pushing back. So just that very grounded example to highlight the way I absolutely agree, we need to seek uh, alliances with actors where we can. Um, yeah, coming back to your uh, more specific question, um, well, I would say clearly policy making doesn't really operate in a, in a rational way. It's, it's a field of struggle with competing uh, interests. There are the economic interests, but there are also parties who have a, a very strong interest in continuing to uh, denounce and mobilize against migrants, specifically uh, negatively racialized migrants or uh, impoverished migrants, right? That that's in their political interest. That's how they uh, generate their, their political capital, right? Um, so, of course, we need to counter those arguments in many different uh, ways. But I think we also need to see that, um, in fact, those contradictions, as you describe them, right, the policies of closures versus actual needs that are also represented by different actors, ha also have a productive dimension. So, ultimately, um, I think that what we have, in fact, is a regime of illegalized and precaritized migration. We've had other regimes in the past. Uh, slave trade, uh, indentured labor, guest workers, right? Well, illegalized migration is not simply uh, a malfunction. It's an enduring outcome of those contradictions. And if it continues to endure, I would say that be it's because it has a productive dimension, politically, for certain actors, but also uh, policies of closure operate a form of inclusive exclusion. Ultimately, people do arrive on European soil, despite the policies designed to keep them out. But their enduring condition is one of precarity, uh, of discrimination, of rightlessness that also um, enables regimes of uh, exploitation. So that's not a, a, a very hopeful uh, answer, uh, I'm afraid. Maybe others have uh, others that I'd like to, uh, to, to hear. Uh, but I guess trying to, to emphasize, on the one hand, absolutely the need to enter in alliances with at times uh, actors that are not in our camp, if you will, but also to see that the, the contradictions that we face, uh, they are productive uh, for some actors, and I think that is also why th this regime is so uh, enduring. Fragen? Eine ist hier. Was, was in seinem Kern ja auch eine rassistische äh, Aktion ist, äh, rassistische eben Verbrechenarbeit, Verbrechensverbrechen und nicht das gleiche Recht oder ähnliche rassistische äh, Geschehen, wo es dann auch wieder Frustration und rassistische äh, Verbrechen gab, gibt, gibt auch zu erleben. Und gleichzeitig möchte ich, möchte ich sagen, das ist eben auch in dem Kontext zu sehen, vor allen Dingen in Wirklichkeit in der Tendenzen, die wir gerade die wir gerade sehen, auch in Frankreich, aber auch 
wie sie involviert, dass man das Bild dem Staat verarmt. Und auch immer wieder die Mitteilung kriegen von Staatsgeschäften, Leute kommen hier an und die schicken wir zu viele Wäschekammern nach Frankreich, nach Madrid, nach Ägypten. Und die ähm, die Geflüchtete als Zeichen Um, so you were voicing that you are grateful for this work that uh, makes visible the racist um, practi practices and the limitation of rights of uh, refugees also that uh, arrived in Europe. And you also wanted to point out that there is another context also of civil society fighting for these equal rights, um, doing work that changes uh, realities here. And, um, and in this context of those two uh, sides, it's very important that you document uh, human rights violations um, in Niger or in other um, places, right? Yeah. You want to comment on that? Okay. I think it's a very nice closing. It's a very nice Schlusswort. Vielen Dank fürs Kommen. Thank you so much, Charles Heller from Border Forensic, to coming uh, for coming tonight and sharing your research. Um, yeah, I think you can follow this. Um, ihr könnt diesem, dieser Veranstaltungsreihe weiter folgen. Es wird weitere Veranstaltungen geben. Und genau, vielleicht gibt es noch einzelne Gespräche jetzt danach. Vielen, vielen Dank. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure to be here.